Right, we've got our coffee chat today and um, we're going to follow up on something that we've talked about quite a few times mentioned, but we wanted to go into a bit more detail today, didn't we, about the doshas, about the microbiome, about the ethics and energy behind food, about choices that we have now that perhaps we didn't have 100 years ago. Yeah. And this is following up, you guys, Catherine, uh, if y'all are following the Dark Outpost TV, Catherine came on on Tuesday and literally blew the show away. Like that was one of the best episodes to be a part of, to watch you. You just, you rocked it, Catherine. And so after we got off with David, I was like, you know what, we need to follow up with this because we were focused on animals at that point, yeah. but we're animals as well. And this is something that a lot of people um, that follow me have asked me about because I mention the doshas a lot and the Ayurvedic diet a lot on my channel. And it's, it's, it's um, you know, I've said this before, uh, when you're in a certain field of work and you obtain all this information, sometimes I think you forget that somebody else doesn't actually know these things that you know because they haven't been exposed to it yet. And, and the dosha diet through the Ayurvedic system changed my life, totally changed everything for me. I was, as a child, I constantly had terrible stomach issues as a child. Uh, my mother tells me stories that when I was like really little, I would tell her like just to put crackers in my lunchbox because I didn't want a lot of food because my stomach would hurt. Um, and no, I went in and I was in and out of doctor's offices, constantly looking at my colon to see what was going on. Doctors could not figure out why I was having these issues. Um, at 14 years old, I stopped eating meat uh, because at that point, I didn't even know what a vegetarian was. But I, every time I ate meat, I would get very sick. My body would just reject it um, a lot. And this, th these issues lasted for me up to the age of 33. And by 33 in my adult life, I was eating a very limited diet of what I knew wouldn't hurt my stomach. And when I went to my first trip to India, when I, I walked into an Ayurvedic clinic and I learned about the doshas and that was like a light bulb went off in my head. And ever since then, I have not had any digestive problems because I learned how to eat for my body and more importantly, for my energy, because we are all energy our body, it runs off of energy. And so when we're looking at food, I call it food magic. We're trying to balance a certain a vibrational frequency of food with the vibrational frequency of your body. And every single human being on this earth is going to be different. It's your disposition. And this doesn't just, when you get into the doshas, it doesn't just go into like, um, the biochemistry, it also looks at your personality as well, because it's all connected, the mind body are connected. And, um, and that is something that I think as Westerners, now the thing about Ayurvedic medicine, for the most part is that it is preventative medicine right? There is a place for Western medicine. There is a place for emergency surgeries. There is a place for some of this stuff, but it's more of the need right now, immediate uh, emergency situation. Whereas the Ayurvedic stuff is going to prepare you to help you live your best life. And something interesting, when I started following my dosha diet, all of a sudden, everything again changed for me. I started to feel feel healthy. And I realized I never felt that my whole life. I had more energy. Uh, my eyes got clearer. And I wasn't like I was uh, our friend Stephanie um, from Spiritual Prote Perspectives of Our Great Awakening. I've been working with her on this off camera. And there are certain things like a lot of people will think, oh, I need a snack all the time. And when they switch their diet up and realize that they're not, that they weren't eating foods good for them. They, they can then go longer periods without eating because their body's actually getting the nutrients. in at that point that it wasn't getting before, because before it didn't have the elements to break down the food you were feeding it. And so there are three different doshas that we, that we work with. And this is the just before you get into that though, before you go through the doshas, can I just add something to that? Because it's, what's really important is nowadays a lot of what we talk when you look up a particular food stuff the problem is you're not just getting that food you're getting all the chemicals the genetic engineering etc that goes with it so when we're going through this there's when the doshas were originally sort of discovered worked with taught we were dealing with real food without this man-made interference. Yeah. And now we've got all the man-made interference, which can be absolutely devastating. We're going to talk about the microbiome. 
we've got to take that information and take it with this new where are we at now and combine the two. So we'll be talking you through that as we go through this, this program. Absolutely. And I will say too, like where I live in the world, we do have a lot of farms. And so if you can go to like get something from a farmer's market where it's not as, of course, everything at this point has a little bit of contamination. You can find certain uh, farmers that will give you, will help you with their produce and stuff like that. Now, can I share a screen, Catherine? Can I, um, I'm yeah. going to pull up the, the doshas for you guys. Now, the interesting thing about the doshas too, is that it also, so one of the principles of Ayurveda is that you have to be, your insides have to match the exterior. They have to be in harmony. And I always laugh with my students here because I live in a big city. So I'm like, that means that you get to go have a greasy pizza pizza and drink a beer every now and again, because we're in a city, right? We have to match. We can't be, but if I lived up in the North Georgia mountains where it's crystal clear and pure, I could, I could go completely um, not, not having any toxins and, and balance the exterior of that as well. So let's um, look at this. Uh, and I'm just pulling up some images guys, because I also want to say too, if this is something you're super interested in, now I am not an Ayurvedic doctor. Ayurveda is the sister science of yoga. Patanjali, who wrote the yoga sutras also wrote a book on Ayurvedic medicine. They do, they do complement each other, but I'm just giving you guys uh, what I know from my education system and from my experiences as uh, as a, a, a client of an, a patient of, of Ayurvedic medicine, but if this is something you're super interested in, I would definitely suggest finding an Ayurvedic clinic in your area. Now, with that being said, most Ayurvedic clinics are going to put you on a vegetarian diet. Um, that is, eighty percent of India is vegetarian. Um, some of them have figured meat out uh, for people who are meat eaters, but for the most part, they're going to want you to go vegetarian. Um, so just so you guys know that. Um, now, we have the three different elements. You have the vata dosha, the pitta dosha, and the kappa dosha. Now, again, guys, this is kappa in Sanskrit. The pH does not make the fa sound like it does in English. It's kappa dosha. Okay, so my dosha, my disposition is vata pitta. So vata is air, it's cerebral. So um, for me, I, I like my, I'm very bony. You can see I have very sharp bones, that's vata. Um, I, I like folklore and legend, I like philosophy, that's cerebral, that's thinking. Um, and, and vata, because it's an air element, it also means that I have very dry skin and I have a very dry colon. My internal organs are have the propensity to be dry as well. So that was why I, as a child, was having a hard time digesting things. It's because my colon, because I carry dominant, predominantly the vata dosha, I am dry. And that's not a bad thing. It's just something you have to know. Now, the pitta dosha is fire. So pittas are usually, and that's my secondary dosha, pittas are usually very, like, I would guess, Catherine, that your daughter is probably pitta because she's an athlete, right? Pittas are very athletic. They're very fast moving. Um, they're very fiery in their energy. They have, they have a healthy sweat. They can sweat healthy. Um, they usually have a really good digestive system. Like they're able to go to the bathroom very quickly. And then kapha dosha is the earth-based, water-based dosha. So kapas are typically, um, kapas are very juicy people to me. They're, uh, they're, they're kind of like, and I, I explain it with the, the personality of a kapha. They're kind of like potheads, but they're not high. They just kind of have that real laid back. They're very, uh, uh, kappas typically have a hard time losing weight. They, they typically are very grounded into the ground. They're very heavy set for the most part. Um, they're usually pretty flexible. Their joints are super juicy. And so what that means now, ideally what we want to look at, ideally, if we were living in a balanced world, which that's not the point of being human, the point of being human is that we come in balanced in order to learn and grow is that would be, we would be equally tri dosha. All right. But that for most people, that's not the case. Some people are tridosha, but that still doesn't mean they're not balanced. They still have to work on balancing. Well, because I, for example, lead with the vata dosha, the air dosha, I cannot eat vata foods. So foods are also in these three categories. So what is a vata food? Well, a vata food, if you think about the vata as being cerebral, it's anything that grows on a vine or grows up like lettuce. You think of a salad. Lettuce is very 
it's got those crazy little leaves that are very kind of raising up um, raw fruits like apples. I, if I, oh, if you give me an apple, I will be sick for two days, a raw apple. Um, you know, so, so I, I can't do juices, um, which, which oddly enough, well, not oddly enough, because I am Vata. Those are the foods that I crave the most because like attracts like. But when I started switching my diet around and eating more kappa based foods, because that's the, the opposite dosha, which for kappa, since it's earth based, that is anything grown in the, in the earth, like a potato, a sweet potato, carrots, anything that's in the earth is kappa based. So for me, as in with an overabundance of vata, I then have to eat kappa to bring that vata down to balance it. And so if I were to eat like an apple or something, it would have to be cooked like applesauce because that's what my disposition, my energy needs. Now, a kappa person, on the other hand, does well on a vata diet, eating apples, eating juices, doing juice cleanses. That would be a good balance for a kappa. Uh, vata, another thing about the vata dosha for me, um, I don't experience hunger pains that often. So for me as a Vata, because I'm cerebral based, when I notice that I'm getting hungry, the first thing I notice is I start to zone out. All right. Cause it's cerebral. So that's my first clue that I need to eat as a Vata. I do have the propensity to forget to eat sometimes. Um, that's just how sometimes in Vatas get to the point where they're about to like space out because they, so I have to keep snacks on me. Now a kappa on the other hand can go hours without eating. Usually these are the people who do really good on like eating once a day, you know, cause it's the way that their body uh, breaks down the energy. Now, now another thing too, like, like let's say a kappa person is trying to lose weight. Cause usually kappas are the ones that struggle with weight issues and they're eating foods that are kappa based, like carrots, uh, potatoes, sweet potatoes, and they're, and they're not losing the weight or they still feel hungry. If they were to switch it to the diet that balances them, all of a sudden their body starts to receive the proper nutrients. And then all of a sudden they too don't crave food. Sometimes when we crave a snack, it's because our body isn't able to get the nutrients out of the food we're giving it to so the body searching for more nutrients. This also goes with oils. So over here in the United States, uh, people are in this big um, coconut oil kick, a coconut oil on everything. Well, my friends, if you're Vata like I am, coconut oil is the worst thing for you because it's cooling and you're already cool and dry, right? So you need- I also say with the coconut oil price as well, there's a lot of misconception because when you're looking at all of these, again, people really need to look at how the stuff is processed yeah, um, and how it's produced because it's like you're calling something something that isn't the real thing. So a lot of the problems are absolutely fitting into these um, categories, but also sometimes when people are, say, following a system like this and it's not working for them, it's not that the system isn't applicable to them, it's that the, the quality of the food. And one of the main things that's really difficult for a consumer to understand is how that food's been processed. So, for yes. example, you can have an organic coconut oil but if it's been um, hot processed through pipes and things, it changes the chemical composition. Compositions they can still sell it as a, a organic coconut oil, but if it's not cold pressed, it, the properties will be completely different, and your body will recognize it in a completely different way. Absolutely, and that's so funny because all of my oils that I have, and I haven't been to India in a while, India in a while since the lockdown happened. But I come back every time I go to India, I come back with like suitcases full of castor oil, coconut oil, because I know it's, it's better quality over there. Um, and that will be something. So if you guys are, if you go to an Ayurvedic doctor, they can probably help you find companies that are going to be ethically uh, creating these oils and create, and I've, I've told, I've said this to you, Catherine, like I can smell it. If I go into a restaurant, I can smell whether or not it's going to upset my, my stomach or not. And usually it has to do with the oil because my body cannot sesame oil is the best oil for me, for my dosha. Um, you can see here, like here's a picture where it shows the diagrams of different body types of, um, of the different uh, doshas. Now, because I like for me, I'm Vata Pitta. So I'm, I've, I'm very um, bony as far as like, I have 
you know, people used to laugh at me, the knobby knees, uh, the knee, my knees are knobby, my, my legs are skinny. That's very vata, but I'm also pitta as my second dosha. That, so that means that I am also very athletic. So that you can see that if, 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 and I know I talk to you guys a lot about exercise, that's, that's the pitta in me coming out that I like to sweat. And that, so that's the two marrying each other. Now, um, as far as if you're like pitta imbalanced, a lot of pittas who are pitta imbalanced should stay away from like spicy foods because there are, their fire is already too active. And so they have to then cool it down. It's balancing that energy. Now, the interesting thing too about the doshas, as I was saying, uh, as above, so below, as inside, as outside, our daytime, our, our days have different hours that are different doshas as well, different dispositions. So vata time, the vata, the cerebral time of day for um, humans is uh, 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. So we, in India, they also call this Brahma Morta, which is, is the time of God. So you think of the cerebral time, the, the thought, the, the, the air, the rising up. This is the time of God from 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. This is why in traditional yoga, like when I'm in India, I get up at 2 and I'm at the shala by 3 a.m. because that's when my practice happens because it's the Vata time, the Brahma Morta time. It's also the time where you are quieter yourself and so you're able to have more of an honesty from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m. is uh, kappa time. And so if you sleep it, and this is a good experiment for people to do. If you it is easier to get up in the morning at five o'clock in the morning than it is to get up at seven o'clock in the morning. Because you're up from 6 to 10 a.m., you're at in kappa time. So you're in a very sleepy, very cocoony time of day where you just want to stay in the bed. But then from 10 a.m., to 2 p.m., you're in pitta time. So this is the real fiery time of the day where you're usually out running your errands. It's when you're eating lunch, which should technically be actually your biggest meal because that's when your body can digest it better because it's in that fiery time of day. And then again, from 2 to 6 in the afternoon, we're going back to vada. Now from 6 to 10 p.m., we're again back in kappa. And so it's super important to go to bed before 10 p.m. because 10 to 2 a.m., so 10 p.m. to 2 a.m., you're again back in pitta time. So if you're, if you're staying up past 10 PM, it's going to be harder to go to bed because you've hit that fire cycle again. And you'll notice that I'm sure Catherine, you have two children, children, a lot of children have the propensity to have stomach viruses when they're kids. And sometimes they would just wake up in the middle of the night, throw up. Usually when your kid's throwing up, it's between 10 PM and 2 AM because that's pizza time. So the elements of the, the earth we're in is giving them that boost to then get out what they need to get out, which we know that's what throwing up is, is the body trying to get rid of something. And so it works in these cycles. And if you can start to learn these cycles and work with them, I it's made such a huge difference for me in my life. Um, as of someone who's Vata, I have a really hard time sleeping. Sleep is not something that comes easy for me. For a Kappa person, they can fall asleep anywhere. Uh, because I overthink things, so my mind goes crazy and start, I start overthinking stuff. So if I make sure I'm in bed and asleep before 10 p.m., I'm way better off than staying up past 10 p.m. And so these are just knowing this information is going to help people really start to, to learn themselves and, and learn this magic of creating this energy. Now, as far as our life too, the whole lifespan of a human being, we have different phases. So when you're a child, when you're born up until puberty, you're in the kappa time. So for me, as a child, I was born Vata Pitta. You always carry your doshas. But as in childhood, I was in that kappa time. And you think of children, they have that cute little puppy fat. Uh, most children just want everyone to be happy. They're yummy and they're sweet and they just want to cocoon. Um, that's the kappa time. And then once we hit puberty and for women, it goes from the, when you get your period to menopause. Uh, so when your period stops for men, it just the same age range, but of course men don't have periods, so they don't have something to market. That's pitta time. So Catherine and I are both in our pitta time of life right now. And as one of my Ayurvedic teachers said, there's nothing scarier than a mom in a minivan because she's out there on fire. She's having her babies. She's, she's building her home. She's building her career. Same with men. You're building your career. You're working hard. You're stable. You're in that fire time of life. 
And then after menopause for women and same age range for men too, you go into the Vata time of life where you're thinking about the more spiritual aspect. You're getting closer to your mortality. So all these things come up. Now for me as a Vata Pitta, I already struggle with things or I have in the past like arthritis, which is common for Vatas because of the dryness of the bones. So I know that when I go into that cycle of life of the Vata time, being a Vata element myself, I'm going to have to be really careful to really follow that diet so that the arthritis doesn't get worse um, because I'll be needing Vata with Vata. And so this is, um, and I tell, I, t- I, t- I was saying this to Stephanie the other day, who's been doing this. Ideally, you know, we, 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 we live and this is, I know this is hard to do. Like we live in a society where you have food is put on the table at dinner and that's it. That's your food. You either eat it or go, go to sleep without food as a kid, right? Sometimes. But ideally, every single person in your household should be eating a different meal, depending on their disposition and what's better served for them. Now, my sister and I are both Vata Pitta, but our parents are both Pitta Kappa. And so that's why a lot of times when I was a child, I could not digest what my parents were easily digesting because we are two different dispositions. Their body could handle it. Mine couldn't. And, but if it was flip-flopped and I was the Vata Pitta making food for a, a Pitta Kappa, they wouldn't be able to digest it. It would be, it would be a different element of energy for them, whereas I could. And I hope that makes sense. It is the most, when you guys, and I know a lot of people do like these little quizzes online to find their dosha. Those are okay, but they're usually just going to give you one dosha, which is your leading dosha, where you're typically a competition of two. And so that's why I always tell people, go go find somebody that they'll look at your eyes. They're going to look at your tongue. They're going to take your pulse. They're going to examine your body. They're going to ask you about your sleeping patterns. They're going to ask you about your lifestyle. Um, and, and that all is giving them information about how you energetically carry yourself in the world, which isn't bad or good. It's just your, your disposition. And so that's going to tell the doctor what you're carrying, and then they can help you balance that, if that makes sense. Yeah, and there's loads of things that this links into. So one of the reasons why people do their own online quizzes, why sometimes it gives them quite misleading information, is because what you're experiencing now physically, emotionally, spiritually can be very, well, we know now scientifically and spiritually that it's very affected by our microbiome because we've got more bacteria, viral, fungal cells in our body. We're more of that than we are human cells. And the thing is, it's like anything, we, we're, most of us, anyone watching this will be quite out of balance because we've got so much, we've spoken so much about the pollutions, the toxicity, whether it's words, whether it's thoughts, whether it's EMF, whether it's air pollution, whether it's heavy metals, whether it's pesticides. So when you go and see a proper practitioner, like you were saying, Bryce, that links into the iridology, for example, that I do, part of what they're looking in the eyes, they're not actually doing a full iridology assessment, but so many of these natural practitioners of anything will come up with the same information from different angles because the thing is you're there's so many clues that are left there and when you then allow yourself to experiment and try these things and adjust over time so that your microbiome can adjust the difference in the vitality people just feel like a different person they feel 10 years younger And a big part of that, I also find, Bryce, which again, your Vedic medicine takes into account, is also your belief systems. Because we are all energy, your belief system will is really important for you to take into account. Because just because a nutritionist is telling you that this type of food is good for your blood type or good for the type of you know athleticism you want to do. If that doesn't align with your core spiritual beliefs, there's going to be a fundamental imbalance there and your body will pick that up and reflect it to you. So that's why when you work with these ancient traditions, all of that is taken into account. And that's why they're so, so successful, because you could, if, if you're shutting down one of your core belief systems because someone's told you that's good for you well it might be for them but it isn't necessarily for you so these i just love these systems because they really do when you go and see someone who really is trained in this all of these aspects are taken into account which is why it's so powerful and so effective in my opinion and that's why i was telling you guys like when my first uh consultation with an ayurvedic doctor 
they, a lot of what they were asking me really had nothing to do with what a medical doctor would have been asking me. It was about my personality. It was about my habits as a human, what I believe, all that kind of stuff. And I'll tell you, when I first was, when I first started struggling with arthritis in my right before I found this system, um, which the, the diet for me has helped a lot with that, um, as people were trying to get me to, to incorporate more bone marrow into my diet. And that I just wouldn't do it. I mean, I, I know like uh, we feed uh, raw gets animal, all that kind of stuff, like with your diet, with because that's his. But for me as a human being, I, I made that decision a long time ago that for me, that was not okay, that I was not going to be taking from another living thing to support my life. And I was getting that from everyone. Like, you're going to struggle with this until you incorporate bone marrow. And I was just like, no. And, um, and yeah, so it is possible. Yeah. And for me, it probably, because I'm a Vata element, which means that I do have the propensity to overthink things. If I had started eating bone marrow, my own guilt, stress, overthinking probably actually would have made it worse because it I would have been so. Yeah. It would have affected your whole microbiome, your ability to process it and your inflammatory molecules. So it's so important that people, we've talked about this the whole way through, haven't we, Bryce? Because so many people do. And I think everyone watching this, but you are unique, but equally getting that expert help. If you feel there's areas of you physically, emotionally, spiritually that are out of balance, there's so many amazing practitioners out there to help because what, can sometimes happen it's like if you're on a very stressed stage you're not going to make good life decisions no that's yeah. over and over again so if unbeknown to you your body's in a stress state and you might not realize it because what we accept as good health now is so far for our animals this is what Bryce and I were talking about with David Zublick for our animals and for ourselves what we accept as normal now is is so far away from normal and it's so exciting when you do find someone that resonates with you in a system that really works for you just to see what's really, really possible. But sometimes, did you find, Bryce, when you were working with that, it, it is important to give things a go, isn't it? And feel yes. whether something resonates with you. But equally, we do live in a society where we expect instantaneous results. And of course, sometimes it will be an instantaneous yes. result. You'll eat something that disagrees with you, you'll throw up. But... Other times, it's like it's allowing your whole energy systems at every level to adjust and take it on board. And that's when you can really get the best results in my experience. When I will say for me, when I first started the, the eating for my dosha, I did immediately feel a difference. Um, yeah. like my body all of a sudden was like celebrating. Uh, I immediately saw a difference in my sleep patterns, all that kind of stuff. But I know that there are some people that and and and, the, and for me the detoxing wasn't that bad and that was yeah. because i have been heavily i think i think because i'm been heavily a heavy exerciser for 15 years now and so my body was used to pushing things out. That's why I think it wasn't so bad for me, but you might experience some detox. You might, when you change your diet like this, you might experience your body having to like recalibrate itself to the, to what, cause especially if you're older and you've been, you know, if you're a Vata like me and you've been eating an apple every day because somebody told you that was healthy for you, but yet your body can't digest it. And all of a sudden you pull back and you eat the fruits and vegetables that are appropriate for your dosha. You might still have to like detox some of those th that stuff out that maybe wasn't vibrationally good for you if that makes sense um and so yes yeah, as well because if you live in a city you're going to be exposed to a lot more toxins in general yeah. than if you are if you're in the living in the middle of nature in the middle of a wood that's absorbing all the toxins so yeah. it's it's just sort of when you find a lot of it is that confidence. So if someone's telling you to this, most people, if they do some sort of detox fast, will feel a lot better after it. But that doesn't necessarily mean that's your long-term habits for you. So the difference is, is when, when you look into this properly, either yourself or with a health practitioner, and they really understand the long-term effects that your body's looking at. Because for most of the time, it's like you imagine if you're in a really bad job that you really hate and you're dreading going to work each day. Once you've admitted to yourself that you're going to leave that job, immediately you feel better because you know your subconscious knows you're going to do something about it. And quite often people then start doubting their decision and they think, well, was it really that bad? 
And yes, it was that bad. It's just your subconscious mind has made a shift that they think, thank God, they're going to do something about it at long last. And so they let go of all that tension. Yeah. So quite often, suddenly changing your diet in any way, people can experience amazing results. And that's why people go on sort of certain fad diets and they're like, oh, it was amazing. But then they realize long term, it's not necessarily right for their body. Because when you make any change, your body thanks you for it. Yeah, because they're like, well, at least they're doing something. But it's important to have from whatever system resonates with you the right information so that you know what's going to be really good for you on a long term basis, not yeah. just a quick and fix. The, and with the dosha diet, I was telling this to our friend Stephanie, I was like, you know, you just because I try to stay away from Vata foods doesn't mean that I don't occasionally have Vata foods. Exactly. It's just I know, I know, I, I've now learned how to know when my body's when I'm getting too much and I have to pull back and eat more kappa foods because it doesn't mean that you can't, you know, ever have an apple. It doesn't mean that you can't ever have, I love juices. And if I'm feeling good and if I've been really good, I'll go and have, you know, and if, if I need to pull it back and eat more ground root vegetables, I'll do it. You just learn how to, you know, it's as, as human beings, as living creatures, we're constantly in this ebb and flow and knowledge is power. And so mm. when you have the knowledge when you do have the time where you're breaking away a little bit, then you know how to fit, how to course correct if you need to later on. And I'll say too, finding Ayurvedic practitioners, guys, it's kind of like a therapist in a sense where you might go to one and have a consultation and you don't really like that person or they're not resonating with you. Then go try someone else. It's the because they are going to get very personal with you. They are going to ask you a lot of questions about your lifestyle, you as a person, as we we're saying, your faith, your beliefs. And that's they they have to have that information. If you're not comfortable with that person, go find another one. I'm sure, especially if you live close to a city, city there are probably a ton of different Ayurvedic doctors that you can choose from. And and test them out too, to see what works. And they'll tell you too. Another thing is like supplements. I know so many people who take way too many supplements for it. They just think, Oh, this is a good supplement. I'm going to take it. That's not true. Some people don't need certain, it depends on your, so the, and the Ayurvedic doctor will help you with that as well. And you'll constantly, every time it's not just a one, one time and done, you're constantly going to be going in and checking in with this doctor. Cause there are going to be yeah. shifts in your life. There are going to be things that are happening and they're going to help you. I'll tell you guys a funny story um, about, cause in the, in the, or the Western world, we're so like into Western medicine, right? The Eastern stuff is like hokey pokey to us a lot of times, but in India, it's the opposite. And there's an Ayurvedic clinic here in Atlanta that I've worked with a lot and done workshops with them a lot. And we've co co hosted events. And the woman who the main woman, she's from Kerala, India, where, where this is kind of the home of Ayurvedic. And she was laughing with me that in, in Kerala, they had to start uh, putting a, a one medical Western doctor in all the Ayurvedic clinics because people would come in with a literal appendicitis looking for help from like plant medicine. And they'd be like, no, 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 you got to go to the hospital. And they'd be like, no, 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 just give me some, some supplement. They'd be like, no, 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 you got to go. You got to go to the hospital. This is not for us. You got to go see it. You got to have surgery. Um, and so over in India, they're having to accept more of the Western as well as we're, we're trying to, to mold that together. So, um, so yeah, the, a lot of the clinics in, in India now have one Western doctor there just to make sure that they they're not ignoring emergency situations and so when you find a good ayurvedic practitioner they're going to have all this into consideration and it, it's it's like for me it was super life-changing and i hope that you know Catherine, you and i talk a lot about the vibrational frequency and us working on ourselves to move forward and, and a lot of that comes with you really knowing yourself and part of that is dealing with what you eat how yeah. you live your life you know and so this is a good place to start and I start, I, I did quite a bit of studying with Paul Check, who's absolutely amazing, and loads of other people, because all part of my iridology training, my herbal medicine training, it's all taken this, you know, a lot of the chakra system, the meridians, all of those are linked to different types of the day. So you're pulling all this information together. And what all of us, you know, we all talk about tuning in with our intuition, but the very first thing is just to really feel, you know, where I would encourage everyone to start to see whether you could really benefit from some extra help is to start to really get present and tune in before you eat or drink something. And just really start practicing, how do I feel? How do I feel energy-wise? How do I feel emotionally-wise? How do my body, do a little body scan down, you know, how do the different areas of my body feel? And then do it afterwards. And there's so much that you can teach yourself 
about what you know what is really serving you and what isn't and and even just doing something that simple I mean perhaps another day but guys we can look at say some of the muscle testing and the sway test and things like that yeah. it's all yeah techniques that you can look into but having fun with it and just really tuning into yourself and asking those questions before and after will really really help you just make those little shifts initially even if it's just something that you want to work on with yourself honestly it will transform your lives it really will and it's really good fun and those of you that are parents to two or four-legged um children it's really important to do that with them so you know with your animals as well you know what are you noticing with what you're feeding them what are you noticing in their reactions etc so we can your the poos the poos are a great thing bryce and i always talk about poos with dogs <laughs> and things um it's so so interesting but have fun with it because knowing yourself knowing you as an individual is really really important and another point that you made which is so important any parent again of two and four-legged um children you've got to look at each of those as an individual you really have so now my lab is 16 and a half her nutritional needs are changing so I'm starting tweaking her diet differently to my older dog so these little changes can really transform how you feel physically and emotionally so I love all that Bryce I think it's so useful and I hope you guys do too and if you find some really good ones share it in the community as well because there's some brilliant brilliant practitioners out there yeah yeah, absolutely. And this has worked for thousands of years. So <laughs> it really has. Have fun with that, everyone. Thanks so much for that, Bryce. It's so, so of useful. Of course. Well, I'll, well, well we're going to be seeing each other very soon again for another very another... soon again. Quick toilets, off, and then we'll be back with the lovely Liz. So, see yes. you soon. Thank you so much for anyone that's watched us. Take care. Bye. Bye.